Here in the green and growing heart of England, two Victorian businessmen once had a strangely un-Victorian idea. It was an idea about people and places, meadows and machinery, full of paradox, it seemed, at the time. Now, in an industrial area like this, yes, an industrial area, why not? Why must a factory grow among the smoke, said these two men? Why shouldn't industry keep company with fields and trees and civilized fresh air? But the idea didn't end there. Around the factory began another experiment. A garden village that would grow gracefully and not blindly. To serve people and not oppress them. Here then is Bourneville. The creation of two brothers. Industrialists who hated industrial ugliness. Realistic reformers who had no time for visions that didn't pay. The Cadbury brothers started making chocolate in a small workshop in Birmingham over a century ago. The business grew, and now the factory in a garden is the biggest cocoa and chocolate factory in the world. and worldwide organization has grown among the two symbols of its own making. The roses that go outside and inside. The one inspired the other. Inside, then, is the other expression of that plan. The roses created by Cadbury's, one of their famous chocolate assortments. Here they are, moving on their courses like well-trained traffic at a crossroads. Some take the high road, others filter off along the side tracks with a different job in view. We're beginning at the end, of course, but I think it's as good as any of looking at this colorful, complex place of wheels and bands and skillful hands and levers, all in a tremendous hurry to fix each chocolate with its going-away dress. to be in the right place at the right moment. farmers of the Gold Coast left off, the factory takes over. From the moment the bags are opened up, the beans will never look the same again.
ever since the Spaniards found cocoa being drunk in Mexico 500 years ago, ever since the Emperor Montezuma was taking his 50 golden goblets a day and using the beans as currency, the first step has always been the same. Roast it. Roast it for an hour to produce the flavor, release the aroma. And even though the rolling ovens do a thousand pounds at a time, roasting can still only be judged by the right man, the right nose, and the right understanding. It's a long way yet to the cup and the saucer and the spoon. You can't infuse a simple crushed up cocoa bean because half of it is cocoa butter. And it has to go quite literally through the mill so that the rollers and the heat they create can pulverize it into a paste. What's being done here is only what the elegant customers of Queen Anne's chocolate houses had done for them and what John Cadbury did with his pestle and mortar a hundred or more years ago. Only here it's done by the tongue. And uh, everyone is uh, the quality now. There are a lot of substances in this brown paste. Most of it we want now, some of it we'll want later. And the only way to sort it out is to squeeze it out. Just apply enormous pressure and the bean gives up. And out of its particles comes some, but not all, of the cocoa butter. And this will be used later on in chocolate. And what's left is a millstone of cocoa as hard as a rock. When all that is ground into powder and sieved through fine silk, those chunks will make enough cups of cocoa for a regiment. <laughs> yes, quite right. Cocoa comes in tins. And where do the tins come from? Right here. like a like restless cube. with cocoa. And here it is, 
as we shall meet it in the grocer's shop. And you know, not only cocoa, but other food drinks join the line. Bon Vita with all the goodness of its rich ingredients. chocolate too, the sweet rich aristocrat of the family. Of course there's much more to a cocoa and chocolate factory than making cocoa and chocolate. This is a versatile place. Here are the presses that print the labels, that go on the tins, that carry the goods, that travel the world from out of the works that... Who built? Why, everybody. The handful of people you see here and all the thousands spread out all over the trades and crafts and technique of this great undertaking. There were just a couple of hundred employees when the firm first came to the River Bourne. Now there are about 8,000 in and among the acres of specialized buildings and thousands more at the Cadbury factories in different parts of the British Commonwealth. For this is what you might call a combined operation. Factories within a factory. One must keep pace with the other. The sequence of production must be strictly governed to avoid bottlenecks. A pile-up of chocolates, for instance, all wrapped up and nowhere to go. There must be as many boxes as the chocolates require, and, and that is plenty. More than 50 million boxes a year to absorb them. Put them lengthways, they would reach to America, and places farther yet. They'll reach there anyway. this factory grows, it must not spread clumsily. The green belt around it is the legacy of the man who knew slums too well, and who made this the answer to those who said you could never make a fortune among the flowers. mark in the day. considerable facilities for doing it, and of course for doing other things too with spare time. Lounges, club rooms, library, concert hall, the time when factory relationships become personal relationships. on much the same as it has done since Cadbury's first came to Bourneville over 70 years ago. 
In those days, it was meadow and woodland, and not much more than that. A trout stream and a cottage or two. Prosperity could have spoiled it, but it didn't. And if this great place is not to be just a workshop, and after all, Britain is full of workshops, uh, but a community too, then it isn't necessary to separate work from play by a great gulf of roads and suburbs and wasted time. So you surround the 80 acres of factory with 120 acres of gardens and playing fields. All this activity is a foreshadowing of what will go on when the weekend comes, on the Saturdays, when work stops and play begins. And now, here is Saturday. You know, Bonville is not just a sports club, nor is it a social institution, nor even a civic experiment. All these activities center around a job to be done, and the object of the operation is the manufacture of cocoa and chocolate. And now to the country that is still the country, among the fields that exist in their own right, the rich pasture land of Shropshire. of it all is in the dairy. And when the Cadbury inspector meets the farmer whose cows produce the milk, there and then you have the genesis of a bar of milk chocolate. But only the very beginning. The whole principle behind the making of milk chocolate took years to think out and develop. Between the cow and the consumer stretches an elaborate process of invention and ingenuity. is only one of several. The same thing goes on in Gloucestershire, Herefordshire, in North Wales, and in Ireland, too. They all get their raw material from the neighboring farms, from the rich pastures that lie around them, so that within a few hours, the milk meets the chocolate. Of course, everyone knows what milk looks like and what it tastes like. And uh, if anybody still puzzles over the famous riddle, how does a glass and a half of milk get into half a pound of milk chocolate? Well, the answer is found in this factory. The trouble about milk is that even the best and purest of it is seven-eighths water. And you don't want water in milk chocolate, so you drive the water out. But first, 
You put the sugar in. it in a great vessel as big as a bath with a paddle as big as an oar. Introduce it eventually into an evaporator, which is a vast and lovely vacuum kettle, gleaming like an orb, provided with a little porthole so that the operator can keep an eye on the whole boiling. And there is your condensed milk, a quarter of its original bulk, four times as feeding. So you have it then. Marry the creamy milk from Shropshire with the cocoa from a shanty. Cream and brown. Britain and Africa. And that is dairy milk chocolate. Once you've taught a machine to weigh it, and drop it into a mold so that it can cool off into those blocks that everyone knows. traveling roadways on which most things here seem to spend their time. From now on, it's up to the wrapping machines. They can handle up to a hundred blocks a minute. box art. People tend to smile at those pictures today. Pretty garlands, Edwardian pin-ups, bouquets and sweet limpid smiles such as were seen nowhere else. Well, nowadays we go in for a simpler line, a cleaner design. Chocolate box art has graduated like the other applied arts of the time. 
And Bourneville, incidentally, is where it all began. Every big industry has its backroom boys, where research and science take over, where the practical people with their vats and machines are reinforced by the strictly one-at-a-time people who test and experiment. Here, in something between a laboratory and a kitchen, the confectioners and chefs have a job which is to prepare not for today, but for tomorrow. Research means the saying new blends, new mixtures, new adventures in flavor, new processes for streamlining the production of what they approve. And if you've never seen a prototype chocolate on the testing bench, well, here it is. the great truth that was discovered by the first inquiring bite of the original taster and learned anew each generation. The making of a chocolate is like the making of a picture, a pearl or a pyramid. It grows from the inside out. A good chocolate begins with the middle. Indeed, we could start anywhere. Fruit, nuts, fudges, caramel. There's a long cast of characters. perhaps. For once the machine is snubbed. Two or three sets of able fingers can handle that, that knobby sweetness better than anything yet invented. Or pineapple. Brazil nuts. All the repertory of fillings that has to include everything that everyone likes and something that no one has tried. Someone had a little nut tree, and someone had a little sugar plantation, and the fruits thereof married and lived happily ever after. Here, in this pile of roasted hazelnuts and caramelized sugar. They will be ground into a paste of a flavor it would be ridiculous to try to describe, but which you will know by the name Noisette. And so far, unfortunately, there's no way of giving you the smell of this. It's a pity. Now here's the recipe for a cream center. You take a quick sand of sweet and delicious material, flavored in such and such a way. This you mix and mingle in a fashion you've learned over the years, delivering it lastly to the remorseless millstones that will combine all your subtleties into a substance that is, well, it's... Well, anyway, that's how to make a cream center. Unless, of course, you want to fill your chocolate with cherries, like this. that pulls the linked sweetness over and over. That knits it until it is ready to become a rope of toffee, a snake of sugar. A serpentine confection to be stamped into those little cushions. existing on its own, a fruit-filled chocolate without the chocolate. Here it goes then, into the 
cream cups, each one getting its precise and accurate ration. You can watch the machine from now on, and you'll never see it bloop or blop too much or too little, nor miss its narrow little mark. trains for the rest of the journey, let's look at something else. A biscuit. <laughs> Hundreds of them. The base of a chocolate biscuit is, as you might imagine, a biscuit. But by no means an ordinary biscuit. One made in a really big way, with your mixing bowl feet across and your well-mixed dough by the hundredweight. regiment of doughboys in the world, moving up to face the fire. A steady trip through the log oven, and here they come again, shoulder to shoulder, with only a few casualties out of line. And over the cliff they go. one found a quick customer. Then comes the moment when the biscuits get themselves promoted and ordained into their station in life, which is that of a chocolate biscuit. is given by a warm shower in what has the sublime and almost magnificent title of the enrober. These finger biscuits are just one of the several kinds whose fresh crispness is sealed in chocolate at Bourneville. You can create a machine to mix the materials, make the shapes, and wrap up the results. But did you ever know of a machine that could, uh, if I may say so, uh, suck it and see? <laughs> Only one. The educated tongue and scholarly palate of human beings whose practice, taste, and knowledge of the industry qualify them for this most exacting panel. They have to pass the novelties and experiments. They have to check the ordinary output, too. They are the jury for the new idea and the old favorite. While the experts taste and ponder, work goes on. The senders are still on their way, still being organized on their conveyor. Now they must be closed and fitted for their graduation gowns in there in Rome. Their turn for the shower bath. And the final accolade, which again is something human hands must do. The distinguishing mark on each piece. The divisional signs for the Turkish delights, the strawberry creams, the marzipan diamonds, the caramel, and all the rest. So that you can always say, oh yes, I knew that was going to be a coffee cream. Now 
we are very nearly at the end of the road. We have seen them made. Seen the centers made, the chocolates made, the boxes made. This is where they each and all arrive at their appointed rendezvous. Here at last are the boxes where sweets compacted lie. sequence after sequence in a properly ordered fashion. Each completed box is checked and weighed and prepared for the next stage of its journey into the hungry world beyond the Bourneville factory. It's been a, a long way from those laden trees of West Africa to here, in the industrial heart of rural England, through so much grinding and pressing, cooking and blending, until now the job is done, the process complete, the product wrapped and boxed and ready for the road at last. Bourneville, we said, was journey's end for the cocoa bean. We were wrong, of course, since from here in many new forms, it starts on any number of new and separate trips. It will have to face long rides by rail and ship. It will have to resist damp and dust and delay, the crackling cold and the heavy heat. And it is packed in such a way that it will. The next thing it knows, it'll probably be in Singapore, or Trinidad, Hong Kong, or Gibraltar. Or maybe the little shop around the corner. Your corner. So the job is done. The product complete. The combination of so many materials, so many tests, so many processes. The whole being indeed greater than the sum of its parts, elaborate as they are.